Hello and welcome. While talking to children about body privacy, body safety and physical abuse is definitely the most confronting, uncomfortable subject for parents and carers to discuss. Naturally, it's uncomfortable for the children also. But having a tough conversation and educating them with the right information and empowering them with the right tools is an adult's responsibility. You know, mo most people think it will never happen to me and we pray that it won't. But did, did you know that statistically in an average Australian primary school class of 22 children, two girls and one boy will report being sexually abused before they are 15. So even if it's not your child that is affected, they may have a conversation um, with a friend at school one day that could lead them to passing like the information and the knowledge onto another child, which could lead them to helping someone else. It's our role as parents, grandparents, carers to fill children up with enough information, positivity and empowerment to challenge and triumph any predator. So to help share important safety messages and expert tips on how you can best do this, we welcome our special guest, Georgia Grayson, Education Officer at the D Daniel Morecambe Foundation, and she's a passionate advocate for children's rights. Now. The Daniel Morcom Foundation aims to make Australia a safer place for children by providing free evidence-based resources and guidance on teaching personal safety with the aim to prevent abuse. Now, the foundation was founded in 2005 by parents Bruce and Denise Morcom as a legacy to their son, Daniel, as a way to give back to the community by educating other children how to stay safe. Now, their vision is to see a future where all children and young people are provided with education, protection and support to be safe and harm from harm and, um, and abuse. Thank you so much for joining us today, Georgia. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. And what an incredible foundation to be part of, and in particular, one that is so dedicated to protecting children from harm and abuse through the provision of resources and education as well. So now we have a lot to cover today, but before we, we get stuck into all of the other questions, I just wanted to establish that we had published your article titled Australia's Biggest Child Safety Lesson, Teaching Personal Safety in the Early Years. Now, for someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you please tell us what it's about and what inspired you to write it? Absolutely. So it's about Australia's biggest child safety lesson, which is one of our flagship programs, which teaches children about their own personal safety in a really positive and empowering way. Um, and that's a national event, which we really use to bring attention of children, uh, educators and parents and carers about having those tough conversations about personal safety and, and the way that we can try and make that a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait to really to dig deep into all of these initiatives, um, which, which are going to be launched is on the 10th of September. Is that right? Yes, that's it. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, a child's brain develops more and more rapidly than at any other time in their life. I'd love to know initially, why do you personally think that it is so important for parents to educate their children on the subject of child protection and safety from a young age? Absolutely. Our motto is talk early, talk often and keep talking. And that's because we know that statistically, so based on the Australian Bureau of Statistics Personal Safety Survey, we know that the average age of first abuse is almost nine years old, 8.8 .8 years at the moment. So um, if we're kidding those key safety messages at the same time when we're teaching about puberty or sex education, then it's really coming too late. Um, for children who are experiencing abuse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and the foundations are in all of the foundational things that we're teaching in the early years about feelings and about supporting each other, being a good friend, all of that feeds into safety education. So it's really the perfect time to start embedding that so that kids can see that as part of their everyday lives. So the early education is the focus. Now, because I understand that a child's brain re reaches 95% of its adult size by the time that a child turns three years old. Now, at that age, of course, the neural connections will continue to develop and grow as the children, as the child experiences the world around them. But as a parent and caregiver, you know, every word, sound, sight, emotion, um, we expose our children to create a pathway in their brain to build future skills. So naturally, we think of 
numeracy and literacy has been the skills that children need and obviously they do and they're the first ones that come to mind however it's really worthwhile to know that it's also a great time to teach them about child safety and protection in these early stages so I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on this. Absolutely. So we know that those early years are key in forming those neural pathways. And what we find with abuse particularly is that the barriers to disclosure uh, come from really deep seated beliefs that about just sort of what's okay and what's not okay. And so if we're getting in really early and helping children to find that that really good definition of of what's safe and unsafe and what they can what they can do their rights you know the, the earlier the better that we embed that yeah and as I mentioned earlier, you know, discussing the subject of child safety may be daunting for many parents and an uncomfortable topic for them to discuss with their children. However, it is necessary. Um, and the reason why, um, I guess, these childhood sexual abuse um, statistics um, are so evident um, are, are quite alarming. As I mentioned earlier on, in, in an average primary school class of 22 children, what two girls and one boy will report being sexually abused before they are 15. And as you mentioned earlier, the average age in which a child uh, first experiences abuse is, you said, 8.8 years, so just close to sort of nine years old. So I just wanted to sort of get your thoughts on what the, these stats are telling us. Yeah, it's unfortunate that these statistics are uh, really quite insightful, but they're also often... Uh, don't really indicate the full extent of the problem because we know how uh, infrequently abuse is actually reported. So I would say that while these stats are really telling and they're indicating to us that child safety and child protection is still a really big issue for our community, I think if anything we need to take from that that this is this is the best it's possibly at at the moment because we don't know how many kids out there haven't yet been able to to recognize their abuse and to be able to disclose that so as horrible as it sounds i think that we we really need to pay attention because it's it's going to be worse than it is projected yeah. at now in your article you list eight key child safety messages in early childhood now what are these messages for children to learn in their early years about personal safety and in particular secrets absolutely so Feelings is our foundational topic and I think that that's a really, really great place to start because personal safety conversations are really confronting and particularly for parents and carers who don't want to frighten their children and that's such a valid point because we believe that personal safety should be empowering and positive positive. and so when we start with delving into our feelings and being able to recognise our feelings when we feel safe and unsafe, that's such an important foundation. So we, uh, we have a lot of activities on our website that you can sort of gamify that process, but sort of things sort of like, oh, Sarah's feeling very angry today. She has her hands on her hips and she's frowning. So that kind of process of kids being able to recognize someone else's feelings as well as their own gives mm -hmm. us a point to would teach them that they always have the right to feel safe. So, you know, they may not be happy all the time or they may not be excited all the time, but they always have the right to have that feeling of safety. Mm -hmm. So that's our, our primary message. And from there, we can build on so many other layers. Um, a lot of people will be familiar with our body clues. Um, and that's simply the concept that our bodies let us know what we're feeling. So again, if we're angry, we might clench our fists or if we're happy, we have a smile on our face. And that gives us a point to teach kids about what their bodies do when they're not feeling safe and how they can recognize that feeling within themselves. So we might have a racing heart or feeling sick in the stomach or our legs might feel shaky. And we can teach that that might be an instance that tells us that we might not be safe. Um, so from there, we have body clues is a recognize. So our, our foundation's message is recognize, react and report. So that is recognize when your body clues are telling you that you might not be safe. And then you have the right to react. So we don't say you should react uh, because that might create feelings of shame if any child with a lived experience of abuse um, is hearing that and feels as though they weren't able to prevent, to prevent that situation because, of course, the onus is not on them. The onus is always on adults to keep kids safe. But we do teach that explicitly that it's okay to say no to anyone and to anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. doesn't matter if that's someone you know really well, if that's an adult, if that's a child, 
If something's making you feel uncomfortable, you're completely within your rights to say, no, I don't want to do this. And then that brings us to recognize, react and report. Um, so the key there is that kids should have at least five people that they can talk to if they ever feel unsafe. At the Daniel Malcolm Foundation, we call that your safety network uh, or your safety helpers. And so having at least one safety helper for each finger on your hand is a really good option. Um, for parents and carers, I would say that it's really important to be aware of who your child is choosing to be their safety helpers and to have that conversation with the safety helper. So if it's your, if it's the child's aunt or uncle, then I would be checking in with them to say, hey, did you know that you've been chosen as a safety helper? For the safety helper, that means promising to listen, believe and help that child no matter what they come to them about. So that brings us through recognising when you're not feeling safe, um, your feelings, recognise, react and report. And then from there, the really key issues for little ones is the difference between public and private. So the difference between public and private spaces. So maybe, you know, at kindy you have supervision in the toilet, but then when you move into preschool, that might change. And so kids are, they do much better when you're able to talk around that differentiation and talk around what's public and what's private. Um, the confronting part there is then, of course, talking about that on the body, so public and private parts of the body. Um, I would really like to make the point there that we strongly recommend using anatomically correct names for body parts. So as embarrassing and difficult as it is to say penis, vagina and vulva to your little ones, it is so, so, so much more protective for them. And that's because we have had instances uh, of children disclosing abuse that has been completely missed because the language that they have for their own bodies isn't understood by the person who that they're con who they're confiding in. So that's another really important topic. And again, we recognise how scary and how difficult that can be. Um, but again, we go back to the message that teaching personal safety should be positive and empowering. So if it does feel uncomfortable, that's okay to acknowledge that and to have a little giggle together and sort of, oh, why does this, why does this feel a little bit weird? And, you know, you can always talk about anything, even if it feels a little bit upsetting. So almost there, we do have the rules about touch. Um, and so again, reinforcing that children are the boss of their own bodies and that they have the right to say no to anything that makes them feel uncomfortable. Um, the rules around the fact that no one can touch their private body parts or ask them to touch their private body parts or show them pictures of body parts. Um, but that essentially comes back to reinforcing that their body is their body. They might need some help to wash and dry their body or from a doctor, but they always have the right to say no. And then we have our secrets and surprises, which is our big focus at the moment. Um, and the key message for parents and carers there is, you know, it, it can get really difficult and secrets and surprises language sneaks in all the time. But if kids are being explicitly taught that they can talk about anything, then that's the best thing that you can do. You know, it, it can be easy to, to slip up, but we go that a surprise is something that will eventually be told and a secret is designed to be kept forever. Um, if a secret feels bad or uncomfortable, again, they have the right to feel safe so they can talk about anything. It's okay to break a promise and it's okay to break a promise on behalf of a friend. Um, you won't get in trouble for telling someone an unsafe secret that someone's asked you to keep. So. Yeah, I guess secrets are a, a normal part of childhood. We've all been there and had pinky promises with our friends. Um, but there, of course, is a darker side to thousands of victims of child abuse. Um, secrets can be devastating and um, com compounding the fear and terror of their abuse and isolating them um, from those with power to help them. So you mentioned that secrets are a weapon used by perpetrators to prevent children from disclosing abuse. So can you give us an example of how perpetrators may use a secret in this manner. Absolutely. Secrets are often used in, in grooming processes as well as in abuse itself. So things that start out seeming harmless, a child being asked not to tell their parent or carer that they've had, you know, chocolate before dinner or 
you know, something like that, um, perpetrators can use that to test the child's um, sort of like secret keeping habit, really. Um, and of course, it can get a, a lot worse than that when abuse is occurring and that is pitched as a secret game or simply uh, used uh, sort of explicitly as, you know, something that you can't share otherwise that child will get in trouble or the perpetrator may get in trouble and that the child is then feeling guilty and responsible for keeping that as a secret um, all around it's such a weapon and our society um sort of yes it's it's yeah it's quite pervasive and so the more that we teach kids that they can talk then the safer that they will be and all children have the right to feel safe all of the time. And if not um, feeling safe, then telling a grown up is definitely and always the right thing yeah. to do. So in your view, why is it imp important to teach children um, to re recognize when something just doesn't feel right then? Yeah. Well, I think that we need to recognize that um, kids are amazingly capable and 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 right from birth they they know themselves and sort of there's nothing really more powerful than their own their own ability to to sort of speak up and i really our motto around here is that we are we we speak directly to kids and we empower kids and we strengthen their own knowledge and skills and the child protection sector really broadly is about that but also about the multitude of layers that are surrounding kids to protect them from harm so um, supporting the capacity of our parents and carers of our educators of our community bystanders who might see or or hear something about our legal system and our child protection system um, and all of that is so so important um, but i i think that we can't fail to recognize that the child themselves is also a really important part of that protective strategy. And when things slip through the cracks in other ways, kids are incredibly powerful and capable. And if they believe in themselves and their own right to be safe and their own right to speak up, then, then we are really serving them directly as well. And you mentioned earlier that there are some specific warning signs that a child might experience. So when a child is having a conversation with an adult, a parent, a carer, an educator, um, some of these warning signs might come up. Could you just, just reiterate and just explain again what they are? You mentioned um, shaky legs and those types of things. So I'll just, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> So body clues can be tricky, especially in the early years, um, but there are so many and they'll be different for every child, of course, and it may just be one or two that they experience. But a lot of the, the ones that we sort of promote are that uh, a racing heart, a sick feeling in the stomach, uh, shaky or wobbly legs, a hair standing up, possibly goosebumps. You could um, go to the toilet without meaning to, crying, any of those really distressing signals that kids would notice within themselves that something's feeling off. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those. And I mean, and they are um, a, a great thing for, for parents to understand if any of those signs or signals are coming through and children are explaining them in their own age appropriate manner. Um, yeah. These are warning signs for parents, carers and educators and adults to, to know. So thank you for sharing those. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, despite that so many parents will have best intentions to have a conversation with their children about safety, many parents and carers and educators feel unprepared or unsure how they can teach personal safety. Now, I understand this um, Australia's biggest child safety lesson is coming up on the 10th of September, as we just mentioned. What can you tell us about it? And um, why is it, I guess, Australia's biggest child safety yeah. lesson? We're so passionate about Australia's biggest child safety lesson. It is filling a gap in that it provides a real plug in and play safety lesson for parents, carers and educators, because we know that talking about personal safety is really hard. And there are so many nuances in the way that you want to teach this so that you're doing the best you can for the kids in your care. So we have created an evidence based uh, trauma informed 
lesson. So it's a video in itself, um, about 15 minutes long. And that is sort of directly teaching kids about a different personal safety topic. So our next Australia's Biggest Child Safety Lesson, as you mentioned, does go live on the 10th of September as part of National Child Protection Week. And that one is specifically designed for four to seven year olds. And it discusses secrets and surprises, bodily autonomy and the rules about touch. So one of those really hard topics to broach and it's so easy to to feel like you're not hitting the right messages or to, to question yourself. And so this lesson provides a full narrative that talks through some of those key safety messages, but we've also got educator guides and parent and carer guides um, to sort of support and build around that lesson that's taking place. And um, we call it Australia's Biggest Child Safety Lesson because we go live um, on our website and that will go live into schools and early learning centres across the country at the same time. So we'll have thousands of kids across Australia who are all receiving those messages and taking part in their own personal safety education. What an incredible initiative. So how can parents, carers um, engage with Australia's biggest child safety lesson then? It's so important that we do have parents and carers involved. The research shows that the more that families are engaged in personal safety, the more that kids take away. And so we've got a couple of different options for parents and carers to get involved. So parents and carers can register on our website to tune in directly. So if you're home with your little ones, you can watch it as a family. Um, and then we also really value parents and carers being able to, to check in with kids who have watched the lesson um, and have a conversation about what they, what they learned and what they experienced. We do have our parent and carer guide on our website, which provides you with a synopsis of the lesson um, and a couple of discussion questions or points you might want to reinforce at home um, just to drive home those messages and support personal safety education across the community. It's definitely an invaluable resource, um, not just for the information, but to, to give parents and carers the opportunity to open these conversations as well. We've covered um, a lot in the chat today. Um, if you were to summarise your key messages for anyone watching and listening, what would they be? Um, they would be that you're doing a great job. If you're trying to cover personal safety education with the children in your lives, then you are being an asset for child protection and child protection is everyone's business. Um, it can feel intimidating, but you're doing really well. As long as you're reinforcing what's true for you and for your, for your children, that they always have the right to feel safe, that they can talk about anything with you, then you're on the right track for sure. Wonderful. And if parents have got any other questions um, and or definitely want, want to get involved, whereabouts can they find you? Absolutely. Head to danielmorecombe.com.au. Uh, you can register to join the lesson, download our guides or any of our other resources. Wonderful. And we'll have all of those links in the show notes. Georgia, congratulations on an incredible initiative and just all the incredible work that the foundation does. Um, it's been a real honour speaking to you today and I uh, really look forward to the opportunity to speak with you guys again in the not too distant future. But until then, stay safe and speak soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much, Rachel. Bye.